Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're joining us today for session 62 of our Forging Forward series, a virtual conference series focused on idea sharing, innovative solutions, and a path forward. I'm your host, Brian Crimmins, Global Managing Partner of 100 and CEO of Changing Our World. And speaking of timeliness and paths forward, I think today's conversation, uh, understanding the NIL, the name, image, and likeness, the implications of this new NCA policy for college athletics and advancement is going to be a fascinating conversation with uh, my, the three guests joining us today. Uh, as often is the case, we had to get shut down in the green room because we kept talking and talking about this very <laughs> subject and some of the news coming out just in the last few hours just in order to go live here. So uh, again, looking forward to it and want to thank my guests in advance for, for joining them. So let me as always, give you a bit of background on each of the guests, and then we'll clear the, the dance floor, if you will. And we'll get into the conversation and the questions with them. So uh, joining us first is Vince Nicastro, the Deputy Commissioner and Chief Operating Officer of the Big East, uh, Bruce Seagull of Council for Greenspoon Martyr LLP, and Brian Young, Managing Director of the Nexus Licensing Group, a fast lane company. So a word about each, and as I said, we'll then get on to the questions. Uh, starting with Vince. <clears throat> in 2016, Vince was named to a newly created position of Deputy Commissioner and Chief Operating Officer for the Big East Conference. He joined the conference office following a long and accomplished career at Villanova University, a Big East member institution since 1980. He served for 15 years from 2000 to 2015 as Villanova's Director of Athletics before being named Associate Director of the Jeffrey Murad Center for the Study of Sports Law at the Villanova School of Law last June. His position includes day-to-day -day oversight of the Big East Conference's operations and business functions, including governance, compliance, finance, NCA institutional and institutional relations, Olympic sport championships, events, communications, marketing sales, and television and digital administration. Vince has served on many Big East and NCAA committees during his career, including the NCAA Committee on Academic Performance and currently serves on the NCAA Committee on Infractions. He played a key role in the transition of the Big East to its current configuration following realignment in 2013, and thank you for that, and was a member of various conference committees on finance, championship, and competition matters over the years. Vince and his wife, Liz, have twin sons, Jake, Jake and Casey. So welcome, Vince. And joining us, Bruce, I mentioned, Bruce uh, brings more than 30 years of sports and industry and intellectual property experience to Green, Green Spoon Martyr. As of counsel to the firm's entertainment, media, and technology industry group, Bruce focuses on sport brand protection and enforcement, licensing, contract negotiation, marketing, and business, develop, business operations helping brand owners maximize intellectual property value through licensing, sponsorship, and endorsement agreements, and assisting licensees on navigating the licensing marketplace. With a strong sports business background, Bruce developed programs to protect the trademark rights of numerous sports clients, including organizing systems to protect the NCAA Final Four and college football playoff marks by clearing the marketplace of counterfeit and unlicensed merchandise in coordination with the event organizers, investigators, and law enforcement officials. Prior to joining Greenspoon Martyr, he served as counsel at a mid-sized business law firm in Atlanta, concentrating on brand protection, licensing, and intellectual <clears throat> property matters, primarily in the sports and entertainment industry. Bruce has also served as the senior vice president and general counsel for the collegiate licensing company, CLC, and its related sports licensing entities. Furthermore, furthermore, Bruce played an essential role in developing and guiding the implementation of CLC's Labor Code of Conduct and monitoring, pro monitoring Program, and worked with collegiate institutions and licensees to implement corporate social responsibility programs designed to ensure that the licensed product-bearing collegiate marks are produced under safe and fair working conditions. Throughout his career, he has shaped the sports and entertainment law community, currently serves as co-chair for the Entertainment Arts and Sports Committee, of the United States Intellectual Property Alliance, former chair for the Legal Advisory Committee of International Collegiate Licensing Association, and past vice chair for the Entertainment Sports Law Section of the State Bar of Georgia. 
Bruce is also a frequent speaker and has authored a number of publications on trademark and licensing protection, as well as anti-counterfeiting best practices, especially surrounding sports branding and special events. So welcome, Bruce. And <clears throat> last but certainly not least, uh, Brian Young. Brian, with over 20 years of experience, is a well-respected licensing industry veteran with deep knowledge and proven success, helping hundreds of collegiate brands protect, promote, and generate revenue from their valued intellectual property. As a founding partner of Nexus Licensing Group, a fast lane company acquired in April of this year, Brian understands the challenges and opportunities that many collegiate properties face, and more importantly, how to navigate them and extend their brand value through existing and new digital channels. Prior to Nexus, Brian served in leadership roles for two licensing agencies. He holds a BS in sports management from Ithaca College and holds an MS in education administration and policy studies from the State University at Albany. So welcome uh, Vince and Bruce and Brian and looking forward to, as I said, a very relevant and very timely conversation. So uh, as always kind of want to set the stage here. So Bruce, we're going to start with you. Why don't you, if you don't mind, walk us through NIL and what is it and what makes it such a hot topic right now? Well, thanks, Brian. I, I appreciate that. And, and thank you for um, having me on the panel. Uh, this is definitely a, a hot topic. And just to set things a little bit in context uh, and to explain exactly just, you know, what are we talking about when we talk about this NIL concept? Um, you know, in the back in the 1980s, schools began to protect their intellectual property. They began registering, protecting, and licensing the use of their names, logos, mascots, other identifying indicia, the focus being on building college brands under the law of trademarks. Now, at the same time, the NCAA has uh, forever strictly prohibited the commercial use of college athletes' names, images, and likenesses based on, on the concept of amateurism you know, college athletes are different from pro athletes. Yep. This is a distinguish. This is a distinction that um, you know leads to there not being the, the ability for a, a student to enter into commercial agreements. So, what is NIL? It, it's different than trademarks. It, it's a part of intellectual property law grounded in the right of publicity. It's basically the right to control the commercial use of your identity, your name, likeness, nickname, signature, and the like. And so it is NIL that really forms the basis for college athletes to be compensated in licensing, sponsorship, endorsements, commercials, and the like. So why is it a hot topic now all of a sudden? Um, it's a hot topic now all of a sudden because the NCAA just in June suspended its long-held ban on student on college athletes from prof, profiting from their name, image, and likeness. This followed some legal developments and it also followed uh, a slew of states that had overridden the NCAA's policy by passing laws that said in our state, no one can prevent a student athlete from monetizing his or her name, image, and likeness. California started the charge back a couple of years ago in the fall of 2019, Florida uh, was the first to have a, a bill that was the earliest to go into effect. That is on, on July 1 um, of, of this three months ago. And so effective July 1, the NL, NIL floodgates are open. The NCAA, because of these pressures, essentially stepped aside. They've deferred to states and individ, individual schools to set name, image, and likeness rules. And what that's kind of resulted in is a, a bit of a patchwork of different laws and policies. Uh, individual universities can develop their own policy regarding you know, the, the guardrails, what they will allow, what they will not allow in the context of student athletes entering into deals and agreements. But these university policies where there's a state law they have to conform to the state law. And just sure. in a nutshell, if you look at the state laws, they have certain things in common. Number one, NIL rights can't be restricted. Um, college athletes can obtain professional representation. However, the contract terms of the college athlete deal can't 
conflict with the institution's current agreements or team rules, and the institution itself can't provide name, image, and likeness compensation to a current or prospective college athlete, no pay for play, so to speak. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it just right now where it stands is that the NCAA during this process and having kind of opened this up a little bit in, in, in a fragmented situation has continually urged Congress to pass a uniform federal law that may provide a, a more consistent set of rules. In fact, just yesterday, speaking about topics, uh, there was a congressional hearing where there were more calls for a federal solution. It was a three hour hearing, so a lot of things happened, but there was a consensus uh, among the five witnesses, including Dr. Emmert from the NCAA, uh, Ramoji Huma, who on the other, you know, is a player rights advocate. They, they both, everyone agrees that there should perhaps be a consistent federal, you know, guidelines. Of course, there, there's not agreement as to what those guidelines or what that, that bill would say. Uh, one other just, you know, worth noting hot topic, you know, the day before this hearing, the uh, National Labor Relations Board General Counsel issued a memorandum um, basically stating that college athletes in the view of the General Counsel should be viewed as employees under the National Labor Relations Act, kind of reopening another continual discussion about, you know, what what exactly is the status of a college athlete? They, They can receive compensation, but in doing so, are they, you know, are they really functioning as, as employees and should have those protections? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, some would say yes. Many, of course, would, would say no, that that could be, that could open up a can of worms. But in any event, this will all be hot topics um, coming up at the NCAA's Constitutional Convention, which kicks off in about a month, uh, where certainly these and, and other issues will be uh, you know, high on the list of, of the agenda. Great. Thanks, Bruce. And thanks for getting us started here and giving us some framework and, and perspective. And Vince, want to go over to you now. Um, I've got to imagine schools are, you know, catching up on this a little bit all over the map, maybe to some degree, others dealing with it right away. I'm sure some of the bigger ones, et cetera. What are some of the stories you're hearing or know of with student athletes capitalizing on this opportunity? Yeah, and Bruce, that's a that's a great summary on a <clears throat> relatively complex topic. So you, you really summed it up in just a few minutes. So thank you for, for teeing that up. Um, yeah, Brian, I think you're right. I think schools are at various stages uh, in terms of their um, handling or, or embracing NIL. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, some knew it was coming uh, and were well prepared for, you know, July 1, flip the switch, especially those in states um, that had state laws that were going to become effective on July 1. Um, then the NCA issued the interim guidance, you know, the day before, uh, which is, um, you, you know, not very specific. It's very broad. And um, I think schools are interpreting that guidance in states that don't have state laws uh, in many different ways. So um, I think people would love to have a... Uh, uh, uniform set of standards around this, as Bruce had mentioned. So in the meantime, there's just a lot of uh, variability. Um, and some of that depends on um, uh, sort of the outlook of, of the school, right? Some are going to be, by nature, more conservative mm-hmm. in terms of how aggressive they want to be with um, allowing students to um, spend time exploiting their name, image, and likeness, um, showing them how to do it, Mm -hmm. educating them on uh, how to improve and increase and uh, and monetize their brands. Uh, Some of them would be very aggressive on uh, allowing them to use university marks and other intellectual property. Mm -hmm. And again, others will be more conservative. But at this point, even in our league with 11 schools, I I think we're seeing uh, various stages of development and just trying to figure it out. Um, And that's... Uh, probably not unexpected. I think in, you know, it's only been three or four months, I guess, that it's been uh, in place. Um, you know, I, I think it's in some cases, um, the activity has been a little underwhelming, right? You're not seeing huge blockbuster deals. You're not seeing, you know, that Zion Williamson is going to get a $5 million deal with Adidas because Duke was a Nike school, right? Um, Maybe some of those are on the horizon here, but um, 
but I think you're seeing uh, a lot of students be, being able to participate and monetize NIL to some extent. Sure. Um, we haven't hit basketball season yet, right? So um, we haven't really seen a lot of high profile basketball players emerge and that's probably because their visibility maximizes here between uh, yep. November and March or November and April. Um, so it's a bit of a work in progress. We're doing a lot of um, uh, assessing the landscape, staying engaged with our schools to see what they're seeing. I, I do think one of the other drivers here will be the recruiting cycle, right? So this will be another factor in recruiting. So when you're recruiting high profile student athletes, you know, they not only ask about um, facilities and coaches and scholarships and cost of attendance and um, my exposure opportunities. Now they're comparing NIL opportunities from school wow. to school to school. So I think once we go through a cycle or two in recruiting, you may see some schools be uh, either more or less aggressive sure. in trying to present what those NIL opportunities will be for incoming um, players. And we may get to this, but I don't think it's necessarily just limited to football, high level football and basketball players, which most people thought. Yep. Some of the early data here is showing that uh, there are a number of other athletes, um, particularly in the social media space, that have very large followings with heavy engagement that, you know, are, are really seeing uh, significant value in the marketplace. Great. Thanks, Vince. Um, Brian, we'll get you in here now. Uh, support for student athletes is a big selling point um, in the world we live in, helping a lot of our college and higher eds with their philanthropy efforts. Curious if you have any thoughts or any specific anecdotes on how donors are now reacting to athletes being able to benefit financially uh, from NIL and their personal brands. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think this really is, a, is an extension uh, from what Vince just explained, yep. you know, related to the recru recruitment process um, and, and how that evolves over time. And, uh, you know, it is so young right now. I think there's a lot to be seen. But, you know, as schools start identifying you know, NIL as, um, you know, a strategy that fits into their, their recruiting mix. Um, they could approach, um, uh, you know, commercial partners and, and, and even donors to some extent uh, in a little different way uh, to, to offer, you know, those NIL deals to, you know, prospective student athletes. Um, so that I think is, is really, you know, yet to be seen. Um, I don't in large part you know, again, to Vince's point about, you know, not seeing blockbuster deals across the entire industry and, and, and so forth. Um, you know, I think the, the traditional, you know, philanthropic uh, strategies, you know, will continue on and continue to be successful, um, you know, specifically as, um, you know, specific, um, you know, you know, uh, uh, purposes are, are put forth. So, you know, mm -hmm. if you're fundraising for a new building, a new field, a new athletic center. Um, I, I believe that, 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 you know, the, those monies will continue to, you know, to come through. Um, it's really going to be, you know, related to those broad, you know, giving, uh, opportunities. And, and if those could be positioned more, uh, as an NIL support, you know, recruitment strategy down the road. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I, you know, I, Again, and, and it's it is so new. Uh, you know, we we work with such a wide variety of schools from, uh, you know, you know, Division One, Two, and Three. Um, I think you know the, uh, the the positions that each are taking now and how they're trying to understand it and what opportunities will be given to them. Um, you know, are large in large part, you know, dependent upon who they are and how they fit into the the mix and how they approach their prospective student athletes. Sure. Um, and we're trying to advise them, you know, the best we can uh, from a from a very specific custom, you know, standpoint that that meets their needs and and uh, and sort of fits into their profile. Yeah, great, Vince. I want to go back and 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 pick pick up where you were. You know, the comment you made about it not necessarily in the early days here being just for the top football and basketball, yeah. you know, players in schools are, are there, it, and I get it, it's early days still, but are there, are there any common traits that we're seeing about with the student, maybe it is what you hit on about their social media presence, but anything else emerging in the early days here about the common traits of who is getting the NIL deals? Yeah. And we've been getting some data, you know, there are a number of companies um, partnering with schools and conferences. So uh, 
companies like Open Doors, Influencer, um, Altius, you know, they're, you know, companies rushing into this space to provide advisory services to our schools. So they're providing us with uh, some early data from what they're seeing. Um, so there are some things that aren't surprising. You know, football is, you know, driving the largest number and probably uh, the, the highest volume, dollar volume of deals at this point. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the Big Ten and the other uh, Power Five football conferences, you know, their, their student athletes are, are at the top of the list too, sure. right? So that's no surprise. But some of the things we are seeing um, are like, like women's volleyball, you know, the data that we saw from Open Doors recently, women's volleyball is second behind football. Wow. And men's basketball was just behind volleyball. Maybe they'll catch up again once we get into the more visible yep. college basketball season. But, um, and then you're seeing some, uh, as I mentioned, some some women's athletes, women athletes who um, largely through large social media and uh, followings and, and heavy engagement have really um, been able to benefit from this. So the, the two that come to mind right away are the Cavender twins who play basketball at Fresno State. Uh, they were, you know, they launched their first NIL deal, I think at midnight or 12.01 a.m. on July 1st. So they made a big splash. Um, but again, primarily through social media influencing. Um, Olivia Dunn is a gymnast at LSU, same thing. Very large social media following, heavy engagement. And uh, um, it looks like she has some significant deals out there. So um, this is a space I think that has room for not just the high level yeah. football and basketball players that others um, will have opportunities to, to benefit from, which is, which is a good thing. Yeah, no, no doubt. No, that's interesting. And thanks for that. That's good data. Um, I think that just to, just to add, I think that, you know, to kind of put a, a and I think those are, are great examples, but I think that they just show that, you know, the, the, the opening up of name, image, and likeness opportunities, you know, is, uh, you know, available to any college athlete, and it's not necessarily going to be the, the elite quarterbacks. In fact, there are several elite quarterbacks uh, who entered into preseason deals who, you um, you know, may not have quite lived up to their sponsors' expectations. Not that they're <laughs> going to be abandoned, and that's going to be the be-all, end-all. But you know, if you're the Clemson quarterback and you're not in the playoffs anymore with your team, and and you know, Dr. Pepper may be saying, "Well, wait a minute, do we we, we kind of we right. placed a big bet on this?" But you know, the, the point being that you know, for those that have strong, you know, social media or, or you know, can use this as an opportunity to develop them, their, themselves. And, you know, talking about somebody being a brand may sound a little crass, but yeah, I think that there's some reality to that. Um, you know, as my friend Doug Phyllis at Accelerate Sports Ventures has said, you are your own brand. And so, you know, you're seeing these really cool examples of, you know, people just limited only by their own creativity and, and, and their ability to, to navigate uh, all of a sudden, you know, can do really cool things. You know, yep. they're not necessarily going to make a fortune, but, you know, I mean, if you're able to, uh, to, to generate from Instagram postings, you know, several hundred dollars, a, a thousand dollars, you know, for a lot of people that could be rent money. It would have been for me when I was in college. <laughs> I didn't have a personal brand, but, um, you know, it, it's a really interesting and, and exciting time to see these things kind of come together. Agreed. You know, Bruce, me, oh, ahead, one, ahead, one thing, yeah, I just wanted to add real quick, you know, I, I think one thing that these student athletes have to have in common um, is, is time management skills, mm -hmm. um, because, you know, as, as student athletes, you know, traditionally uh, with practice and game schedules and going to school and now having to, you know, manage uh, your, your name, image, likeness and find business opportunities that just makes a, a complex life even more complex. And, you know, um, I, I, th I think and I hope that there are, you know, uh, support structures in place, uh, both from an institutional standpoint um, and certainly, you know, agency representation that can uh, can kind of minimize, uh, you know, the, um, um, you know, the, the, the overburden uh, time management issues that, that could uh, arise. But, uh, and I, I feel for them, you know, uh, being yeah. in, in positions that they are and, and uh, you know, Obviously, some of the big athletes or the big social media followings, they will just come to you. But I think there's a large contingent of kids out there that are trying to capitalize on it and trying to find ways 
um, and just hope that they um, they don't get you know derailed and uh, and focusing on what's most important. And I think I'll jump in. I mean, just to uh, accentuate that point, I I think there are a number of coaches that are conflicted about this because mm -hmm. they know they need to be in the NIL game and uh, and and be encouraging it so that in recruiting um, they have a, they have a benefit or an advantage, but they also don't want their student athletes distracted from you know their sport their academics remember they are still students pursuing college degrees and chasing nil deals all the time right so it becomes another full-time um, attention getter for them and so i think you're right this is going to be a real balancing act to make sure that um, um, they can manage uh, their commitment to their sport commitment to their yeah. academics but also take advantage of these opportunities if they can, but try to maintain some equilibrium there. Well said. Uh, Bruce, want to go back up to you with just on a, another kind of contextual question here. What control do the athletic programs themselves have over the athletes' involvement in these deals, if any? Well, yeah, no, there, there are a few things that come to mind. I mean, as we you know talked about a little bit earlier, um, you know, there it, this the process and, and the regulation and the rules have become decentralized in a way that institutions, you know, with, with conferences, you know, have the ability to, to right now create and, and, and shape their own, um, you know, procedures and, and, and rules and regulations. Um, you know, in, in most university policies that I'm aware of, as well as in state laws, um, you know, universities um, have the, the right and, and the ability and, um, you know, the ability to enforce disclosure rules. And the, you know, one of the interesting things is that these vary, right, you know, from state to state, you know, what does disclosure of a deal mean? When does disclosure have to take place before you enter into to the deal or at some point after? And is you know, is putting something up for disclosure seeking approval, or is it just you know FYI? Mm -hmm. um, so you know, there, there, these are you know there, there is some control there because there is an obligation. And I was reading just this morning that that Ohio State, for example, you know, 400 student athletes have already disclosed potential deals, which is a big number. You know, uh, avoiding conflicts. You know, in, in each um, you know state law, there you know there is the, you know, regulation, you know, basically saying, you know, don't enter into an agreement that would conflict with our current sponsors' rights. Mm -hmm. And again, a lot of this is going to be open for interpretation as the process unfolds. You know, what is a conflict? Is it, you know, wearing a competing, um, you know, sneaker on the field? What about off the field? You know, th there are, there, there's still a lot to be sorted out there. <laughs> But I think also, you know, to, to that point, it's, you know, determining as an institution whether you're going to allow your intellectual property rights to, to be used in connection with a student athlete deal or, or vice versa. Um, you know, can a sponsor, um, you know, gain access to assets that include a student athlete name, image, and likeness to complement or to expand upon uh, their rights? Um, and so that's up to the institution at this point. Now, I would note that the NCAA in its proposed legislation, you know, back in the summer, basically would have prohibited co-branding. Right. Um, they would have prohibited group licensing as well, which is kind of a, a similar related topic. And that is that, you know, that there is a, a company brander that has done deals with starting with UNC, Texas, Alabama, Ohio State, many, many institutions that you know, basically create the ability for a licensee or a sponsor to come in and obtain the rights to a, a larger number of student athletes. That together with co-branding is the sort of thing, at least in, in my mind, that opens up opportunities to, the, you know, to, to many more that you know, then would be the case if it's only going to be a, a student athlete by student athlete, deal by deal basis. And so I think that there's you know, there's a lot of, um, you know, ability to influence these programs um, and maybe too much at this point because <laughs> there are a lot of things to, to figure out and, and where do you come out on all of these things, but um, yes. Yeah, no, certainly 
hearing you all talk, this analogy that just keeps popping in my head is this is a feels from an outside looking in here, a little bit of the Wild West is so much is being figured out on the fly here. And, and, and Brian, I want to come to you with building on where kind of Bruce was. I mean, what's the school, you know, will schools, excuse me, license their, their marks? I mean, two student athletes and how, yeah, how does the school's brand fit in in all this in your perspective? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, a lot of that, you know, again, uh, is dependent upon who the institution is, um, you know, what their profile is, what their reach is, um, and, and what their strategy, you know, could be in using, you know, NIL to, to further, you know, advance their own identity. Um, you know, to, to Bruce's point, you know, certainly, you know, Brander is out there, you know, for your, your large uh, group licensing deals. Um, and, you know, if that, you know, extends to a, a Fanatics, you know, memorabilia, uh, deal or, um, you know, a, a Jersey program, right. uh, certainly, you know, EA sports and the video game category, you know, could, could make a return. Uh, and, and they are, I think, you know, equipped to, uh, to manage those massive, you know, massive deals. Um, you know, we've worked with, with a few of our clients that see it as uh, a new brand extension, you know, for them, um, in a way t- to reach, um, you know, potential student athletes, potential recruits, in different parts of the country uh, that they otherwise wouldn't have a presence. Um, we're working with one school um, right now who has a large hockey profile uh, and uh, the, the student athlete wants to go back to the state of Maine and host a camp and is asking to use the institution's identity as part of that, you know, as part of that camp. And um, they see it as a great, you know, opportunity for additional exposure and, uh, competition, you know, amongst uh, institutions that they compete against uh, in that area. So, um, you know, I, I think again, it, it all depends on on the on the product and and the scale of of the group, you know, licensing. Um, we have you know a few other clients who uh, you know I think are looking at the the co branded opportunities not in mass like a large jersey program or you know EA Sports video games, but you know, what can we do more locally, uh, you know, with, um, you know, a, a partner, you know, uh, sponsor of, of the institutions that, you know, might want to extend it uh, to an appearance or some sort of autograph session with a student athlete. Um, so mm-hmm. there's, there's a lot of local opportunity as well that I think will unfold over time. Um, and it's really, you know, going to be, again, on, on the, the institution, um, you know, their, their media rights, uh, you know, partners um, yep. and, and other agents they work with to, you know, find those opportunities and structure them. So uh, it's a benefit both to the institution and the student athlete. Great. Um, you know, Vince, again, in kind of its early days here, but I'm curious, have you heard of any or seen any examples of corporate sponsors backing away from their support of the college as, a, as an entity and going directly to the student athlete? Has anything like that occurred yet? Yeah, I haven't seen anything substantive at this point, Brian, but there was a tremendous amount of trepidation, uh, particularly in the parts of the third party multimedia rights holders, right? So the Learfields, IMGs, and others who were in that space, who were guaranteeing royalties to the schools, and then fearful that, you know, some of their most significant sponsors would shift their investments, you know, away from the institution and directly to the individual student athletes. Probably a little too early to tell at this point, <clears throat> but I know there was uh, a great deal of anxiety about, about that reallocation. Sure, sure. Um, great, that's helpful. Um, Bruce and Brian, and for any events, anyone, kind of this question I have is that, you know, it, it seems as clearly this space is evolving, but, and we've talked about some of the ways, early ways we see schools are benefiting or, or might be. The camp's a great example, Brian, you know, that you just brought up. As this plays out, Vince, you talked about, you know, things like basketball season emerging, the recruiting season, you know, um, so we still have a ways to go here, I think, as this plays out, which you've all pointed out, but are there benefits on the horizon in year two or three for the, for the schools that maybe aren't here yet that you think are a possibility? I think that there, there are, and, and there certainly, you know, should be. And again, this is, you know, getting into the, the realm perhaps of, you know, of, of opinion, but, you know, to, to me, um, it, it, you know, hopefully, it, you know, let's say, you know, several years down the road, you know, how will this process be perceived, you know, right now, again, anything, 
you're whenever you go through a paradigm shift like this, there, yep. there are going to be concerns. There are going to be, you know, this has never been the case. Why is it all of a sudden the case now? Uh, if you're in NCA compliance, you know, why is this coming to fruition under my watch? <laughs> but, um, but, you know, to, to me, you know, in, in five years, you know, hopefully if this, you know, goes as I hope that it does, and many do, you know, I, I think that people will look back and say, wow, this was not that, you know, th this wasn't that, you know, threatening of a situation because in, in the end, um, you know, sure, I think a rising tide can lift all boats here. Um, you know, there are just so many opportunities to strengthen relationships, to, you know, to look at, you know, this in, you know, in a positive partnership sort of way. One example that I really loved to hear about and, and, and read a little bit about was, um, you know, programs where you just feel so good about how the university has been involved and to, to the benefit of, of student athletes. And there's this Brigham Young University example where um, Brigham Young got, walk, got walk-ons their entire yearly tuition paid for by a sponsor, by a Utah-based protein bar company called Built Brands. And so they're already a, comp a corporate partner, but you know the idea was presented and, and the deal was done where they came up with multi-year NIL agreements with BYU players that include some compensation to all members of the team. Everybody participates. And for the 36 walk-ons at BYU, the amount was comparable to the cost of tuition for the entire academic year. That's really interesting. Brian or Vince, do you see any, any comments? Is there any thoughts on how you, what you might see way out in the horizon for this as it matures? Yeah, I, I think as, as Bruce mentioned, um, you know, whenever you see significant change in our business, there's a lot of uh, gnashing of the teeth and wringing of the hands. And, you know, it's not going to be like it was. And we saw it uh, with cost of attendance not long ago, five or six years ago. Um, it hasn't changed the dynamic whatsoever. Mm -hmm. uh, the only thing that has changed is more resources are, are going directly to the students um, mm -hmm. to support their education and support them personally. So that sounds to me like, like a good thing. Yeah. Um, gambling, right? I mean, that was going to be the thing that crumbles every industry. And now look at the professional sports leagues are all embracing it yep. after pushing back. So, um, you, you know, if anything, you could make a case that it's increased engagement with, uh, with their constituents and fans and others. Um, so I, I'm with Bruce. I think this will be the same as we go through a few cycles. It'll, it'll reach some type of homeostasis. People will feel um, more comfortable around it. And again, there'll be a variety of schools. Some will be really aggressive. Some will be more conservative and there'll be a lot of schools in between, um, which is with any regulation is what we see, whether it's recruiting yep. or otherwise. Um, but at the end of the day, you're gonna see um, young people, students and their families benefiting from this, which um, you know I think is the end result is gonna be a positive. Well said. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I just uh, couldn't couldn't agree more. I think over the next few years, the dust will settle. I mean, I think we're already uh, seeing some of of the the excitement and unknown start to come together. And obviously, we have a lot further to go still. Sure. Um, and you know, common, uh, you know, common common law, common you know directives uh, across uh, the entire NCA landscape. I think will only help that. Um, and uh, hopefully, you know, policies and processes will be put in place, you know, with the institutions and, and their agents to, you know, again, keep this uh, as something that is positive to the student athletes and doesn't become overburdensome or, or you know, change, uh, you know, you know, what they're focused on um, as students and athletes. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, in the end, I think innovation wins as well, you know, to yeah. Vince, Vince's point, uh, there will be some schools and, and some uh, student athletes that are very innovative and opportunities that, you know, will carry their cost of attendance and beyond. Um, and, um, and others will be happy with where they are and that's okay. So uh, yep. a lot yet to be told. I yep. think that's a great point. And I think, you know, overarching and, you know, keep always keep in mind that, you know, the, the importance of education throughout the process and, you know, the roles that 
institutions are playing, you know, whether it be financial literacy courses, you know, making resources available. Because again, you know, th these are exciting opportunities, but there's also, you know, th there's also the, the the potential for pitfalls, which is mm -hmm. what, what I'm trained to, to think about. You know, what if, you know, things go wrong? What if you get in with the wrong entity and you end up, you know, having a, a very negative experience that, you know, inures to, to your detriment and and so it's so important to have the ability to have access to you know to good counsel whether it be on ip issues contractual <laughs> issues you know who you're going to to be involved with you know you certainly don't want to end up having like a big tax burden because you know right. hey it's so cool i'm generating all this money and hey i got this car and then all of a sudden <laughs> wait a to. minute you know that's that, that's kind of taxable stuff there and so uh, and, and again even on social media um, you know, you've got to be aware that, you know, there is even, you know, to a social media influencer, you know, some level of, of risk if, if you don't mm -hmm. be, remain compliant with FTC guidelines. And so there, you know, there are great opportunities, but I think that there are also great responsibilities to, you know, to, to do this right. And as a young person, it's important. And it's at the end of the day, it's going to be upon, you know, the, the, the individuals to make the right decisions, but hopefully they've got access to and the ability to take advantage of good people around them that can provide you know, sound advice. Uh, great points. Great points indeed. So uh, Vince and Bruce and Brian, thanks for helping us unpack this uh, topic. Uh, as I said, I know there's a lot of interest coming in this week on social media and, and some people had took the time to reach out to me to tell me how excited they were to hear this, hear all your perspectives. So thank you for that. On a personal level, as a former basketball manager for St. John's University. I can't help but think of what Felipe Lopez, who was with me at the us at the time, would have been able to do with an, an NIL. And uh, can't wait to have that chat with him about that at some point. Um, but yeah, it's exciting. And, and you've all talked about, you know, exciting, but, you know, a lot to learn and still a lot to unpack. So uh, traditional fashion, um, just give each of you just another opportunity to give any kind of final comments or guidance or thoughts or advice to those who are, are with us live today or those who will be listening to the recording after. We've got a great mix of college, universities, corporations, maybe even some student athletes themselves. So I'll go uh, top down on my screen here. So we'll start with Bruce, Vince, and then over to Brian to bring us home. But Bruce, any final comments or thoughts for everybody listening today? Um, I, I would just say that, um, again, this this is you know, in the, the world of, of collegiate athletics and, and collegiate marketing, you know, fascinating times on, on so many different fronts. And, um, you know, when I think of it, and, you know, obviously it's, it's not about me, but when I think of, you know, my, you know, career and involvement in, in collegiate marketing and, and branding, um, you know, we started, and, and in the early days, it was all about, you know, changing a, a paradigm, which was as basic as a school didn't protect and license its marks to all of a sudden, you know, we're going out and, uh, you know, trying to enforce these rights, trying to convince licensees um, that weren't licensees at the time that the rules have changed and you can keep producing product bearing this institution's mark. But by the way, you need to sign this contract, you need to pay royalties, you need to get insurance and and do all of these things. And it was an evolution to see trademark rights, you know, become established. Um, and, you know, now that we've kind of come full circle and, you know, it's sort of starting anew with a new set of intellectual property rights, i.e. the right of publicity and the name, image, and likeness, and, and to see, you know, how those will evolve and, and become important assets to the individuals, just like trademarks became important assets to, to collegiate institutions. And again, hopefully to my point, you know, doing this in a way where it's looked at as a, in a spirit of collaboration, as opposed to, you know, it, it's kind of, you know, us against them mentality. So um, it'll be interesting to, to see how this plays out and, and definitely stay tuned. <laughs> well said, Bruce. Vince? Yeah, so from a big picture standpoint, I mean, for many years now, not just, recently. Um, we have been moving um, inexorably, you know, towards um, a, a, a changed model of college athletics, right? As much as people want to hold on to the past, mm -hmm. it's heading in that direction. 
And we as leaders in that industry need to figure out how to, you know, preserve everything that's unique and distinctive and special about this, uh, this uh, one of its kind marriage of competitive athletics and higher education, mm -hmm. but also um, students being uh, more empowered than ever, having uh, more opportunities than ever financially and otherwise. And, um, you know, it's coming, it's been coming for a long time. This is just one piece of that puzzle. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, with yesterday's news, there's probably more, more of that empowerment coming. And, um, you know, I, I think it's probably smart, as Bruce said, to, to look at this as a collaborative way of managing these dynamics in the industry as, a, as opposed to it being adversarial. Great points. Thanks, Vince. Brian? Uh, yeah, and I, you know, just just would add, you know, I, I think that you know those of us that are that are in the business, I think there's a uh, a responsibility of sorts, you know, to obviously, uh, you know, protect and look that look after the uh, the brands that are our institutions, but also, um, you know, do right by our student athletes and their their new uh, uh, opportunities and and provide them with you know the resources and education and and so forth that uh, can create that win win situation you know, over, over time, um, you know, and for those that are, are brand new to the space and certainly Professor Mineta's class that's listening in today, um, you know, keep, keep an eye on all the trades because yeah. as hopefully you've heard today, things are changing very quickly. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it'll be important for all of us to understand all the dynamics as things come together over the next couple of years. And, um, you know, there's, I have a, I have a, a, a Google alert on NIL, as probably many of us do here, and it is incredible the amount of information you get on a day-to-day -day basis. So yeah. uh, hopefully over time, it, it comes together nicely, and uh, it can be that win-win that we all think it can be. Great, great. Well, well, Bruce and Vince and Brian, again, thank you. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to, to educate us, to to talk about this fast evolving uh, opportunity, as many of you had called it with the NIL. Um, so thank you to you. Thank you to the audience uh, who are listening. Um, if for the first time or for many different times, I appreciate it. Um, as we bring this session 62 to a close, I wish everybody have a great rest of the day, great weekend, and we'll certainly see you back here for section 63 of Forging Forward. But thanks again, Bruce, Vince, and Brian, and uh, thanks to the aforementioned Ed Minetta for helping us get this thing organized and to his class. Thanks for joining us. Thanks everybody. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Thanks Brian. Thank you.